Gal Dixie here. Today I wanna to talk to you about cheap gear versus expensive gear and dig into why there might be such a huge price difference between two of the same items. In the past when I've done videos comparing cheaper gear to expensive gear, it seems like most commenters who expressed an opinion felt like it must be cheaper materials and greedy American companies. But I think there really is more to it than that. So let's get started. One big factor in cost is where a material or an item is made. Many of the cheaper backpacking gear products are made in China where laborers are paid less than US workers are. Also, there's a larger pool of laborers in China and their health and safety laws just aren't what they are here in the US and in other countries. What I won't be doing in this video is speculating about whether Chinese companies intentionally lower the margins of their exports to drive foreign companies out of business because I just really don't know a whole lot about all that. There are additional reasons as to why Chinese products might be so cheap and I'm gonna include an article in the video description if you wanna learn more about that. Another contributing factor to whether a piece of gear is cheap or expensive might be who is making the product. You've got cottage companies versus these large manufacturers. A cottage gear company designs and manufactures their own products. Cottage gear companies also tend to offer items that aren't available in mainstream manufacturing. Like you can get certain items that are customized for more lightweight preferring customers from a cottage company than you can from a store, say like REI, that sells gear from these larger companies. They're also typically at the forefront of any fabric or material innovations because they're making one piece of gear at a time and they don't need to or either can't inventory large amounts of raw materials. The larger manufacturers, however, and especially Chinese companies included, can put out gear at a lower cost because they do tend to stock materials and get these at a cheaper cost because they get it in bulk. Something else to consider is how products are made. Are they made by hand? Is it a labor intensive process? Or is it something that can be done with a machine, you know, one after the other after the other? For example, companies who make products out of Dyneema composite fabric or DCF, as you hear quite frequently in the backpacking world, especially the more ultralight backpacking world, there are really three different options that they have for bonding two pieces of that material together. They can either use a PSA tape, sew it together and then seam tape it, or it can be heat bonded. Heat bonding or heat welding is where heat is applied and where the fibers intersect, they end up bonding together. All of these processes are used and can work just fine, but especially the taping and sewing has its limitations. Taping can fail if you have extreme temperatures, really cold or really hot. Sewing causes a weakness in especially a non-woven fabric, so under extreme stress it can fail. But heat bonding seems to be the best bet for putting two pieces of DCF together because supposedly that heat bond is even stronger than the fabric itself. So even these small differences in how a product is put together can affect the price. Z-Packs, for example, sews and then seam tapes their products right here in the US. Durston tents are designed in Canada, but they're actually constructed and heat bonded over in China. According to Dan Durston, the factory he uses in China is the only one in the world who will perform the heat bonding process to his standards. Because it's a labor intensive process, it takes a lot of time, then of course it's gonna end up costing more money. Next, you got quality of materials and how or where they're sourced. For example, down that has been sourced ethically is going to be more expensive than down that wasn't sourced by those same standards. Also, you pay a price for convenience. If you get a product that's already been UV treated or waterproofed, you're gonna pay for those processes because they take time and resources. Or if you'd rather trade off, then you can always get those products that haven't received those treatments and you can do them yourself. Also in the same vein of convenience is lightweight gear. People are willing to pay more for lightweight gear because it's convenient to carry a pack that weighs less than a pack that's 
potentially a good bit heavier. As the popularity of a product goes up, then the demand for it goes up and also the price goes up. Let's also not forget the logo premium. Those brands that you recognize when you see the label are able to charge more than a company that's never been heard of because they have the trust through their brand that it's a quality product. Finally, research and development should be considered. It takes a lot of time and money to come up with ideas, to research them, to actually test them. So a lot of these companies that offer products for a much lower price haven't invested in that and instead they just kind of knock off somebody else's idea and put it into their own design. So now I want to get down to the nitty gritty and actually compare a cheap gear loadout to an expensive gear loadout. First, let's start off with the big three, which also in that I include a pack liner and a sleeping pad. Starting off with the shelter, for the cheap gear item, I selected the A-Glory tent that I found on Amazon. It's a one to two person camping tent. It costs $40 and weighs 74 ounces or 4.6 pounds. For the expensive tent, I chose the Z-Pax Duplex, which costs $699 and weighs 18 and a half ounces. The expensive tent, the Z-Pax Duplex, is made out of the strongest fabric in the world, which I was just talking about earlier, DCF or Dyneema Composite Fabric. It's waterproof and it's also significantly more lightweight than other fabrics used to make tents like nylon or polyester. Also, this fabric does not stretch, so if you put it up and have a rainy night, it's gonna stay taut all night long, where nylon and polyester will kind of absorb that water, add more weight to the fabric that you're toting when it's soaked the next day, and also it's gonna sag after you have it set up. The A-Glory tent, in contrast, is made from polyester. Nylon is stretchier and stronger, which means it's typically gonna last longer than polyester, so it makes sense that this tent is so cheap because it's basically made out of the cheapest material that it makes sense to make a tent out of. But also, the Z-Pax Duplex is made right here in the United States, where the A-Glory tent is made in China. So you've got cheaper fabrics, you've got it made by probably a factory that's just mass producing these tents and putting different brands on them. And I also wanna mention that the tent poles are made out of fiberglass, which is probably the cheapest way to make tent poles, but they are not going to be very durable. I had a Walmart tent that I picked up and took out on a full Walmart gear loadout trip. And while it lasted me the four or so days that I was out in the Sipsy wilderness, when I got home, I wanted to test it in the rain because I never got rained on while I was out there. And before it could get a good rain test, it collapsed under its own weight because it had fiberglass poles. But sometimes you do get what you pay for. And with the A-Glory tent, I didn't feel comfortable throwing the idea out there to people who might be searching for cheap backpacking gear without putting eyes on it myself. So I noticed that it was already seam taped, waterproofed when I got it in. I do like that. And I put it up in the backyard to give it a good rain test. And surprisingly, it did fine. It was very dry on the inside after being rained on multiple times in the span of a few days. It held up in decently windy conditions, nothing crazy. But all in all, I think that this would be a decent tent. It's got some of the bells and the whistles that I like, like a little hook on the inside of the tent that you could hang your headlamp on, pockets to put some things that you don't want to lose in the mix of the rest of your gear. And this tent actually has a vestibule, a place where you could put some gear, especially if you are actually using this as a two person tent. With that said, again, I really do think that the fiberglass tent poles are going to be the most limiting factor of this tent. Thankfully, you don't have to decide between one of the most expensive tents on the market and one of the cheapest tents on the market. There are midway tents as far as weight and pricing goes, but you can see how each of these tents would be useful to somebody. The expensive tent being a through hiker who is going to carry the weight of the shelter on their back for potentially six plus months and is willing to pay that extra money for something that's really lightweight on their back, especially considering that's probably the cheapest rent they've ever paid for. A through hiker wants a tent that can hold up in any weather condition because 
you can't really cherry pick your weather when you're out on a six month trip. And with the cheaper tent, you've got the weekender who's going out when they are pretty sure the weather's going to be good and maybe they're not covering a whole lot of ground. So it doesn't matter to them how much it weighs or the boy scout who's just getting into scouting and you want to make sure that he actually likes camping before you pay an arm and a leg on something better. Now let's talk about packs. For the cheap pack, I selected the Nevo Rhino pack. You can find it on Amazon. Right now, it's approximately $65 and weighs about 42 ounces. For my expensive pack selection, I went with the Mo from Adam Packs. The base price of this pack is $355, but you have to pay extra for the hip belt pockets. I assume most people are gonna go with two hip belt pockets like I did. So for that, the pack is gonna be closer to $400, and the whole kit and caboodle that I got weighs 33 ounces. Adam packs are made in England, while the cheaper alternative here was likely made in China. Adam packs uses a variety of waterproof and abrasion proof materials. One to note specifically is their EcoPack EPX 200. It's actually a recycled 200 denier fabric that's treated with a DWR finish, so that's just their waterproofing. Make note that although this is made with a waterproof fabric, Adam Packs tells their customers that they don't seam tape their packs, so they're not actually a waterproof pack all around because it can leak where the stitching is. But any pack that's marketed as a waterproof pack, I never trust that anyway, because even if they do their best and they do actually seal off the pack and it's truly waterproof, you never know when you could scrub the waterproofing off or maybe get a little pinhole and then your pack ends up flooded. So I always use redundancies when it comes to waterproofing, like a pack liner. Anyway, I have used both of these packs, the Nevo Rhino and the Mo from Adam Packs. And I can definitely say that the Adam Packs, the Mo, carries the weight of my gear much more comfortably. And this is one of those times where, you know, Adam Packs has put in the research and development. They've put a lot of time and effort into the designs of their packs to make sure that they're carrying comfortably for people on trail so it's not a suffer fest. Whereas the Nevo Rhino is basically like a ripoff of an Osprey pack, which is another well-known brand in the backpacking world. Also with Adam Packs, you can customize your pack. They've got a lot of different options that are built into their website. So as you're ordering your pack, you get to select all these different options and colors. And if you have an idea for some sort of feature on the pack that isn't listed on the website, you can always contact them and they might be willing to implement that when they build your pack. One downside that I should mention if you do order from cottage companies is oftentimes there are lead times for different items. If they've got a bunch of orders in in the heat of the backpacking season, these things are made to order, so there might be a wait time. Whereas if you're ordering from a big manufacturer, then they've already got hundreds of them in stock ready to ship out. As I mentioned, you should have a pack liner in your pack. So for the cheap option, I've selected the Nilo Fume pack liners that Garage Grown Gear sells. For a single liner, they cost $2.40 and they weigh 0.9 ounces, so just under an ounce. On the expensive end of things, I selected a DCF pack liner made by Z-Packs. It costs $60 and weighs 1.4 ounces. So in this instance, the Nilo Fume pack liner is made out of plastic. The z -Pack's pack liner is made out of DCF, but this is one of those instances where I actually think that you get the better product with the cheaper item than the expensive item. So expensive doesn't always equal the best quality or the best product for the job. While Dyneema composite fabric is the strongest material in the world, it's not necessarily the best for abrasion resistance, where the Nilo Fume Pack Liner, people have reported that these liners have lasted them more than one hacking season. And I'm actually gonna use one of these on the Arizona Trail and see how long it lasts me. I'll have a backup in a resupply box at some point, but I just kinda wanna see how well they perform. I've used them on several of my shorter trips and they held up well, so I feel confident about taking it out to the AZT. The Dyneema pack liner, on the other hand, likely won't make it through an entire hiking season and especially not a 2,000 plus mile through hack. And if it did actually make it, 
and stay whole, then you're probably going to develop some pinholes in it over time and have to patch it with some of the repair tape that a lot of Dyneema tents come with. So I just think in this instance, it's not worth the money to go with the expensive item. Now let's talk about sleeping bags slash quilts. For the cheaper item, I went with the Teton Sports Trailhead 20 degree mummy bag. It costs $53 and weighs about 46 ounces or two pounds, 14 ounces. For the expensive item, I chose the Catabatic Owl Sec 22 degree quilt. I used this one before I found out I had a down allergy and it was my absolute favorite, but it costs $430 and weighs 22.2 ounces. So the cheaper item in this instance is less than a quarter of the price, but it's double the weight. And mainly because the outer shell material of the expensive quilt is more lightweight and also the fill material used for that quilt is down which is much more lightweight than the synthetic fill used in the cheaper bag. The cheap bag is made in China and the more expensive quilt is made by a company in Colorado here in the U.S. Something else to pay attention to between these two items is the temperature rating. On the label it seems like they're pretty comparable but the cheaper item is actually rated for survival at that temperature where the more expensive item is rated for comfort at that temperature. And when you're out there shivering, it does make a big difference, I promise. As a side note, there are some standardized ratings that are done by third parties for some of the larger manufacturers. So I'm sure as a consumer, if a company does have a bag that follows those standardized ratings done by that third party, you end up having that trickle down to you and pay more for it. So you need to make sure if you're shopping with a company that doesn't use those standardized ratings that the temperature that you see on the label is actually for comfort or if it's for survival then you need to be aware of that. If you wanted to buy one of the cheaper bags that had a similar temperature rating to the Catabatic quilt then you'd have to go with the zero degree bag and that's going to cost you 40 more dollars and weigh 1.3 pounds more. I've never used the cheap sleeping bag, but I did order it just so I could put eyes on it because I didn't want to blindly mention a product on here that people might buy and then hate. My personal opinion after looking at it and feeling of it, the 20 degree rating, like I mentioned, is definitely an extreme rating. It doesn't seem like I'd be comfortable in that bag for sure at 20 degrees. It's just not very thick and fluffy. So while it looks like a well put together bag, a quality product, it's not something that I would want to take out in 20 degree weather. Because of the big weight difference between synthetic fill and down fill, that's one of the big reasons that through hikers tend to opt for down bags over synthetic bags. Unfortunately, I have discovered over time that I have a down allergy, so I've been forced to start using synthetic bags. I just don't like them as much because they're bulkier, they take up more room in your pack, and they're not as lightweight. The most lightweight quilt that I've found for my build, the dimensions that I need, was Enlightened Equipment's Custom Enigma. It's made out of Apex and it cost me $230 and weighs 27 ounces. But if you're gonna go with a down sleeping bag or quilt, just know that those are gonna vary in price based on the material, specifically the down. Loftier down or a higher fill power down is typically more desirable because you need less of it to have the same temperature rating as a less fluffy down. For example, a sleeping bag that uses 900 fill power down and is rated for 20 degrees is going to use less down to get that 20 degree rating than a sleeping bag or quilt that uses 800 fill power down. So in turn, it's going to be more lightweight having a higher fill power down for a similar temperature rating as an 800 fill power down. But also with a higher fill power down and being more lightweight, that means it's likely going to be more expensive. Not only is fill power considered with down, but also ethics. For example, if you go with the company Feathered Friends, you might pay 400 to $600 for a sleeping bag or quilt that is made using ethically sourced down. So this basically means that the birds used 
to collect the down to create the sleeping bag or quilt were not live plucked or force fed. Don't let ethically sourced trick you into thinking that no birds died to create the quilt or sleeping bag because that's just not true. Sleeping pads. For the cheap item, I went with Ozark Trail Close Cell Foam Blue Camp Sleeping Pad. It costs about $15 and weighs 11.2 ounces. For the expensive sleeping pad, I chose Thermarest Neo Air X Lite. Depending on the pad you get, it costs about $200 and weighs 12 ounces. This cheap sleeping pad is pretty much as cheap as you can get. It's very similar to the one I used on my AT through hike starting out before I transitioned to the Neo Air X Lite. The expensive sleeping pad you could swap out for others in this price range, but this is just my old trusty, the one that I've gotten stuck on and really haven't found a sleeping pad I preferred more that's as lightweight. The main difference between these two sleeping pads is comfort. I can definitely vouch that an inflatable sleeping pad has always in every instance been more comfortable to me than a closed cell foam pad. The foam pads tend to be pretty miserable for people like me who like to sleep on their side or even their stomach, basically anything other than just their back all night long. Also with sleeping pads, you have to consider our value because that's the pads ability to keep you warm at night. Basically, the higher the R value, the more insulating it is. Walmart didn't list an R value for this closed cell foam pad, but the X lights R value is typically three to five, depending on which pad you get. The women's X light tends to run a little warmer, for example, than the men's. The cheap pad is likely made in China. While the Neo Air says it's built in the USA, not sure if that means they source the materials from China or what, but for materials and construction, there's a lot more that goes into creating the inflatable sleeping pad that's got baffles, whereas the closed cell phone pad is just one continuous piece of foam. Foam pads can be trimmed down to match the length of the person or height of the person sleeping on them so they can become more lightweight but they're pretty much indestructible with an inflatable sleeping pad you do always run the risk of popping it which is why i like to carry a repair kit with me but typically the real fancy air pads aren't too much heavier than a closed cell foam pad but this is just one of those instances where the nicer, more comfortable, expensive item just happens to be a little bit heavier too. Now let's transition to the kitchen and talk about food and water. I wanna start off with food bags. For the cheap item, I've chosen a dry bag from Walmart made in China, probably by some sort of mass manufacturer versus z Packs bear bag made from DCF, made by a cottage company here in the US. Personally, out of these two, I prefer the expensive z pack just because it saves a couple ounces but i can see how for a lot of people it wouldn't make sense to pay this much for a dry bag to put your food in when you're hiking now let's cover stoves for the cheap stove i picked the brs stove that you can find on amazon it costs right now 17 dollars and weighs 0.9 ounces for the expensive side of the spectrum i chose the msr pocket rocket 2 which costs $60 and weighs 2.6 ounces. There are way more expensive backpacking stoves like wood burning stoves and jet bowls, but they're so heavy that in my opinion, it's not as practical for a through hike or backpacking in general as a pocket rocket too. I'm pretty certain that the BRS stove is a Chinese product and it even says on the REI website that the MSR Pocket Rocket 2 is an imported item. But I will say that the MSR Pocket Rocket 2 is said to be more fuel efficient, so you end up using less fuel and over time, I guess that could certainly save you money with your fuel consumption. Also, I would say that BRS is not as well known, except it has become more popular and more expensive over time but MSR is certainly a well-known brand that people trust and so they have that edge up on brand recognition. I've been using my BRS stove for about five years now and it's held in there like a champ. It's lighter and less expensive than the MSR Pocket Rocket 2. So this is just another instance of paying less for less weight. But this time I actually prefer the cheaper item. And now on to food pots. 
For the cheap item, I selected the Stanco grease pot that costs right now about $12 and weighs 3.5 ounces. For the expensive item, I picked the Tokes 900 milliliter titanium food pot. It's $45 and weighs four ounces. In this instance, between the two products, there's a $33 difference and the more expensive item only weighs half an ounce more. But there is some caution from health professionals about cooking in aluminum because it's not really been tested and proven safe, whereas cooking in titanium is apparently just fine. So that is something to consider. I still use my Stanco aluminum grease pot that I started backpacking with when I began my through hike of the Appalachian Trail back in 2015. It's just a personal preference. It's my old trusty and it's sentimental at this point. Back then I was on a really tight budget and it only cost me like seven to eight dollars. So that's why I went with that. But at this point, it doesn't really make sense that I wouldn't just upgrade to a titanium pot. So if I was not on a super tight budget, then for 33 extra dollars in this one, I would think the expensive item would win out. I like to drink out of a cup while I'm backpacking. That way I can eat whatever food in my pot and have coffee in my cup if I want to at the same time. So I included that in this loadout. For the cheaper item, I chose the Ozark Trail 16 ounce silicone cup. It costs $3 and weighs two ounces, supposedly online, but that is not a definitive weight because I don't always believe those online weights. For the expensive cup, I went with the Tokes 450 milliliter titanium cup. It costs $20 and weighs 2.7 ounces. This is another one of those instances where I think the cheaper item wins because the collapsible cup takes up less space. It's cheaper and also weighs less, if the two ounces is correct, than the more expensive item. But considering materials, the price difference does make sense. And now you have to have an eating utensil for a spoon. The cheap item, you can pick up a plastic spoon at the gas station if you don't already have one at home. So it would be free and weigh less than an ounce. For the expensive item, my trusty go-to is a Tokes long handled titanium spoon. This costs $10 and also weighs less than an ounce at 0.7 ounces. Materials obviously come into play here, but the titanium spoon is going to last you way, way longer than a plastic spoon from a gas station or any plastic spoon for that matter. Especially if you're gonna be eating backpacker meals that come in the pouches, the Tokes long handled spoon is worth its weight in gold because you don't have to dig your hand all down in there getting it dirty and you're not left with a broken plastic spoon in the middle of the trail. So I think for the investment of $10, this more expensive item is definitely worth it. And now on to water treatment. The cheapest version of treating your water is going to be boiling water on a fire. If you boil water for five minutes, pretty much anything that's in it that's alive that you have to worry about will die. Although to get a water filter these days, it's pretty cheap. I go with the Sawyer Squeeze. They have a mini version that's only $20, but the standard size that I prefer is $40. The $40 filter is around three ounces and they do make way more expensive filtration systems, but they're just excessively heavy. And in my opinion, the cost of them just doesn't really make sense. Something like the Platypus Gravity Filter costs over a hundred dollars and you're getting a water bladder, some tubing and a filter. Again, with this, you're paying for convenience because you collect the water and just hang it up in the tree and gravity does the work for you, but you're paying more, carrying something that's a heavier weight than the Sawyer Squeeze would be. And if you were gonna do something like a gravity system, then I would just convert the Sawyer Squeeze to a gravity filter. Now let's talk about rain gear. For the cheaper item, I've selected a Magellan vinyl poncho. It costs $6, but weighs around a couple pounds. On the expensive end of things, I went with the Enlightened Equipments Women's Visp. This jacket may be discontinued. I noticed that I couldn't find a purchase page for it on their website anymore. They may be coming out with a new version. But anyway, mine cost $190 and weighs five ounces. So that's just to cover the top. On the bottom end, I like Anti-Gravity Gears rain pants. 
They cost $65 and weigh five ounces. The cheaper rain gear is made out of PVC, which is a very inexpensive material, and it's going to be very heavy and not really very breathable. Also, it's made in China. The expensive items I listed, the jacket and the pants, are both made by a cottage company here in the US. The rain jacket has a three layer waterproof breathable fabric construction. It's lightweight and a lot of these cottage companies offer the options of pit zips to help with ventilation. In my opinion, the rain pants are really reasonably priced considering they're coming from a cottage company and they're so lightweight, but there are more expensive options out there. They're just typically more expensive due to brand recognition and they're a lot heavier. If I was on a really tight budget like I was when I started my through hike of the AT, then I would go for the Frog Togs Ultralight Rain Suit. It costs $20 for the jacket and the pants. It's not gonna be as durable as the $6 poncho that I mentioned or the expensive jacket and rain pants, but it's breathable. It's much more lightweight than that vinyl poncho. And so for a $14 upgrade, it just makes sense to me. I went through two sets of these on my entire AT through hike. So one set didn't last the whole way, but even 40 bucks for rain gear for an entire through hike is a pretty good deal. And finally, trekking poles. For a cheap set of trekking poles, I opted for the Cascade Mountain Tech aluminum trekking poles you can find on Amazon for about $30. On the expensive side of things, I went with Black Diamond's Alpine Carbon Cork trekking poles, and those are around $200. I couldn't get a clear answer as to where either of these trekking poles is actually made, but with this instance, you've got an aluminum trekking pole versus a carbon fiber trekking pole. So the aluminum is cheaper to produce than the carbon fiber. Also, you've got brand recognition with Black Diamond being a very well-known backpacking gear company. I have used both sets of these trekking poles and I can say that they will both get the job done. In fact, one of my patrons on Patreon told me the other night during one of our Q and A's that he used Cascade Mountain Tech trekking poles for his entire AT through hike and they survived. I've always wondered if they would, but the black diamond trekking poles just have a more stable feel to them when you use them. They're less bouncy and they're more rigid when you hit the ground with them. I've never had to do any surgery on my black diamond trekking poles as far as tightening up the lever locks. Whereas my Cascade Mountain Tech trekking poles, I did have to tighten those up. So is it worth the $170 difference? That's really up to the individual that's buying them. I'm not going to get into clothing and footwear in this gear loadout because for the cheap end of things, you can wear stuff that you already have at home. Just ask Grandma Gatewood who took all of her gear from things that she had at home or you can go out and buy all the fancy pretty outfits and the high-end hiking shoes, etc. It just really depends on your personal preferences, your budget, and what you're doing. So the totals, excluding the weight of the trekking poles, obviously, because you'll likely have those in your hands. For the cheap gear, the cost is $248 for a total weight of 13 pounds, eight ounces. The expensive gear is $2,469 and weighs six pounds, 15 ounces. So basically for the expensive gear versus cheap gear, you've got approximately 10 times the cost for about half the weight. So I fully understand that not everybody who is getting into the backpacking world wants to spend 2000 plus dollars on all new backpacking gear. There is the option to save money looking at online backpacking forums like Facebook groups, for example, where people focus on buying and selling used gear. You can also wait for a certain times of the year when there are holiday sales and get things at a discount or even on clearance. And then there's the option of buying cheap gear, like some of the gear items that I've mentioned in this video. So how do you know what's okay to skimp on and what you should really invest in and make sure you're getting a quality product? Well, in my opinion, this may differ from person to person, but there are certainly things that you can just get the cheap version of and always upgrade later. The things that I think are worth investing in from the beginning are especially your big three. Your shelter, tent, or if you want to be a hammocker, your sleeping bag, and your pack. 
those things in my opinion are worth spending the money on because they're really gonna add or take away from your comfort while you're on the trail. And worst case, if you decide you don't like backpacking, you can sell those items used and still get a decent amount of your money back. Some of the things that I think are okay to skimp on are bear bags, footwear, you can get by just wearing tennis shoes that you already have. Clothing, again, you probably have decent stuff at home. Trekking poles, rain gear, water filtration, kitchen setup, sleeping pad, and pack liners. Probably the next one on that list that I would recommend upgrading would be a sleeping pad because again, that adds a lot to your comfort. And if you're not sleeping well at night, then you're probably not gonna feel as good during the day while you're hacking. They do have uh, pretty reasonably priced sleeping pads that are inflatable on Amazon that aren't as cheap as the closed cell phone pad I mentioned in this video, but aren't as expensive as the $200 X-Lite that I prefer. Well, all right, y'all, that is all I have for you today on cheap gear versus expensive gear. I would love to hear your thoughts about this in the comments below, especially if you have another budget item than one of the ones I listed to help those folks who are working on a tight budget who wanna get into the world of backpacking. Thank y'all so much for watching and we'll see y'all next time.